All right, so here we are with segment two, uh, compounds and their bonds. Uh, when we were last here, we were talking about two types of compounds, starting to focus on that second type, which is the ionic compounds. All right, so an ionic compound is going to be made of cations and anions. So if we recall from the last segment, a cation will be formed by a metal, and an anion will be formed by a nonmetal. So that means an ionic compound then will be made of metals and nonmetals. The idea here is that the electrons that are going to be lost by the metal are going to be gained by the nonmetal. So the cation, remember, loses electrons. Calcium became calcium plus two. And then, of course, the nonmetal is going to gain electrons. Oxygen became O minus two. So that means that if we had calcium with a plus two, oxygen with a minus two, what should happen is the cation and the anion will surround each other, forming a compound, and that smallest piece will be a formula unit. So it's not a molecule. Even though we've talked about molecules, we've said that compounds are molecules. Not all compounds are going to be molecules. Some compounds are going to be ionic, and we refer to them as salts or formula units. Now, a formula unit, it's simply the smallest whole number ratio of atoms in an ionic compound. And again, the, ion, the ions themselves are going to surround each other, so you won't be able to say which one is hooked to which one. And that's going to be one of the differentiations there between a formula unit and a molecule. Molecules, we're going to know exactly which atoms are connected to which atoms. But in a formula unit, we don't know. It's a repeating pattern. Okay, so we don't know which one is actually connected to which where the electrons went from one to the other. We just know the electrons have to balance out to make a neutral compound, and that's what's going to be important. So ionic compounds then, for the bonding, we're going to have the anion and the cation are going to be held together simply by positive charges. So the electrons are transferred, and now we have two different ions of opposite charge, and we know that opposites attract. So ionic compounds are also referred to as salts, and again, it's the simplest ratio, and we're going to call that a formula unit. Now, the bond is formed by the transfer of electrons. That's the key word here. That's the one you want to emphasize. Transfer. The electrons have been transferred, like money from a bank. From one account to another, the money was transferred. It's not shared. It's not somehow in both places. It's transferred. It went from one account to the other account. Now, electrons are going to be transferred to achieve a noble gas configuration. So, that means I'm not going to gain or lose more electrons than I need to. We've already seen that. Now, for sodium, sodium has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven. In order to make both happy, sodium wants to lose one. Chlorine wants to gain one. So, sodium is going to transfer its electron over to the chlorine as such. Now, once that transfer takes place... Sodium becomes a positive charge. Chlorine becomes a negative charge. Sorry, I had to take a little pause there. Um, got a message that I had to see to you right away. Um, hopefully that didn't stutter too bad right there. Um, so we were talking about ionic bonding. Sodium had lost its electron to chlorine. We now have two ions that are opposite charges. And so we've made a compound sodium chloride. Now, we can do this with any cation and any anion. So let's take another look. All the electrons, again, have to be accounted for. So this time I'm going to start with calcium, which has two electrons, and phosphorus, which has five. Now, calcium is a metal, so we know it's going to lose its electrons, and so it's going to lose two electrons. So both of those electrons are going to jump over to the phosphorus, and at this point, we've made a calcium plus two. Now, the phosphorus here is a you know, still a minus two, but that's not going to be good enough, right? Remember, phosphorus started with five electrons, so it needs three to be happy. Now, in a true ionic compound here, <clears throat> what I can do is either add more calcium or more phosphorus, because everything we're going to be working with is considered a binary compound. That only you have two things, right? A calcium and a phosphorus. So if I need more electrons to be donated, then what I'm going to want to do is add in a calcium. Now the calcium will lose one electron, the phosphorus will become a negative three ion and is now happy, it's reached its octet. So when I say something's happy, it means it's got its eight electrons. On the other side though, we have another calcium here that now only has one electron, so it's not happy that way. It needs to get rid of that electron. So I'm going to introduce a second phosphorus. 
And introducing that second phosphorus, we're going to see that electron go over to the phosphorus. The calcium is now happy, but the phosphorus is left out in the cold yet again. And so now I'm going to introduce a third calcium. And I'm going to keep going through this process until finally we get everything to line up. So yeah, we have three calciums, all of which are plus two. And now we have a phosphorus. Both of those now are negative three. So they're complete ions. Both of them have full octet shells and everybody's happy. Now the result of this is not Ca plus 2P minus 3, but Ca3P2. So what we've done is we've crisscrossed the charges. You see it took two phosphorus to make everybody happy, and it took three calciums to make everybody happy. And so we have Ca subscript 3, because there's three calciums there, and then P subscript 2, again, because we needed two phosphorus to make everybody happy. Now, that is our formula unit. That's the repeating pattern, Ca3P2. In reality, this would be a big mix of calciums and phosphoruses all over the place with those opposite charges attracting one another. And we can't actually say which metal gave which electrons to which non-metal. Okay, but the end result is we end up with the simplest formula, Ca3P2. Now, properties of ionic compounds, right? They're going to be crystalline in structure. They're going to have a regular repeating arrangement, so we won't be able to tell who's connected to who. The ions are going to be strongly bonded. In fact, these are the strongest bonds. And because they're such strong bonds, we end up with a very rigid structure as well. The other thing we see with these strong bonds is high melting points. Okay, So high melting points, because of that strong force between those ions, when I'm looking at melting, what I have to do is give it enough energy to get that bond to weaken down to become a liquid. All right, so high melting points are usually um, a good precursor to knowing that we have a strong bond. Now, the next thing we want to look at with these compounds is naming. So, so let's look at how we're going to name these things. Well, to name them, it's going to be systematic. All right, there's way too many compounds for us to try to remember all the possible names. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to name the different components. And then as the components are interchanged, the name will be derived in a systematic way. So the compounds for us are going to be made of two or more elements. And what we're going to do is take ions and put them together. Now, whenever we have a chemical name, that name needs to tell us what is there and how many are there. So those are the two things that need to be in every single name, regardless of the type of compound. So we need to know what is there and how many are there. Now, when it comes to ionic compounds, the system is to name the ions, okay? So that's what we're gonna learn. We're gonna learn a systematic way to name ions. Now, if it's a cation and it's in group A, then you simply write the name of the metal, right? So for instance, most of us know NaCl as sodium chloride. And so we're gonna use that as our jump off point. We all know that name, sodium, and sodium is the name of the element. But look at the chloride. There's gonna be some changes to the chloride, right? The ending is gonna tell us what's going on. So we don't say sodium chlorine, we say sodium chloride. Now, as long as it's group A, it's pretty straightforward. And we're gonna see some practice with that. Don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you hanging on that. Um, but when it comes to transition metals, it's gonna get a little more complex. Now, transition metals, we haven't really talked about them too much yet. We looked at electron configurations and then we kind of put them off to the side and now we're bringing them back in. And as we bring them back in for naming, what you're gonna to need to know is you're gonna be able to use the Roman numeral to figure out the charge. So transition metals can have multiple charges. So for instance, iron, which is in blood, is plus two or plus three. Now, does it make a difference whether it's plus two or plus three in my blood? Yes, it does, very much so. So which one is in my blood? What's well, iron plus two? It has everything to do with how the iron connects to oxygen. Remember, oxygen needs to get to the cells, and that's the job of the blood. The blood carries the oxygen to the cells. Oxygen with a, I mean, excuse me, iron with a plus three charge holds on to oxygen too tightly. That means as the oxygen's traveling through my body, it wouldn't let go of the oxygen at the cells. It would just hold it all the way through. Okay. Iron two, on the other hand, while it does like oxygen, it will release it when the pressure changes. And I'm sure you're getting familiar with what blood pressure is, especially if you're in one of these two courses, you're probably heading for the medical field. So you, I'm sure you have a good idea what blood pressure is by now. So as the pressure goes up, 
Iron two is more likely to let go of the oxygen. So when you get to the extremities of like your fingers, it'll start to let go of oxygen there until it's completely gone and then comes back into the system to get reoxygenated when it gets to the lungs. So does it matter? Yes. And what we're gonna do is use a Roman numeral. Now you saw how I was saying iron two and iron three. What I'm really saying is iron Roman numeral two and iron Roman numeral three. So whatever the charge is on the metal will represent that with a Roman numeral. Now let's practice. So here's Na plus one. So sodium, sodium metal, right? Is it a transition metal? No, it's simply a metal. So we would call that sodium ion. How about calcium plus two? And I'll try to give you a spacer here to pause for each one so you can kind of come up with your own answer if you need to before you look at the answer I give you. All right, so calcium plus two. So calcium, is it a metal or a non-metal? It's a metal. Is it a transition metal? No, it's not. So we just simply name it calcium ion. Al plus three. Aluminum ion, right? So it's not a transition metal. So we're just going to simply name what we see. Fe plus three. So iron is a transition metal. And here it's telling us the charge is a plus three. That means we're going to generate the Roman numeral from that charge. And so Fe plus three becomes iron three ion. How about Fe plus two? Hopefully you can hear those dogs barking. It's not coming over this too, too bad. We are fostering puppies. And so every once in a while they get a little annoying down there, um, going crazy in between potty breaks and sleeping. All right, let's try to focus here. Fe plus two would be iron two ion. How about PB plus two? Now lead, lead and tin are gonna be some exceptions. So I'm gonna give you a warning here without a little too much of a pause. Lead is in group 4A. And if you look back on that uh, periodic table when we broke down the charges, I didn't have a charge for group 4A. And that's because lead and tin, both in group 4A, are gonna behave like transition metals. So that means we're gonna give you the charge in the Roman numeral format. So even though it's not a transition metal, we're gonna name it like a transition metal. All right, so I had to go bark at those puppies. They were making way too much noise. I couldn't focus, sorry. All right, so we were talking about lead and lead and tin acting like transition metals. And so PB plus two means that we're gonna have a Roman numeral there. We're gonna call it lead two ion. All right, so again, that's lead and tin, SN, will also do that. How about lithium plus one, Li plus one? So not a transition metal. We're simply gonna name what we see. And so that's gonna be lithium ion. Now, when it comes to ionic naming, we need to be able to do both things. We need to be able to name a compound. So if we have a formula, we should be able to come up with a name. And if we have a name, we're gonna to need to be able to come up with a formula. And quite honestly, we're gonna to need to be able to write formulas more often than names. So writing formulas for these then. So we have potassium ion. So notice the ending, potassium, eum, means metal typically. And so that means we're gonna be looking at the left side of our periodic table, trying to find potassium. Um, if you're using the periodic table I provided on D2L, the names are on there, so you don't need to try to hunt and peck names down. Typically, if you're looking in a textbook on the cover, usually one cover of the textbook will give you the periodic table, and then right on the other page will be the names. So, and typically the names, in this textbook at least, are in alphabetical order. So if I'm looking for potassium, I can find potassium and then find that it's K, right? So, then the next thing I want to do is look at what group is it in. So potassium is in group 1A, which means according to that periodic table in the slideshow, it should be a K with a plus one as a superscript, right? So that's the system for that. You're going to look up the name one way or another, either on a periodic table or in a chart or a table, and then find the letter, then figure out on which letter is going to give you which charge, okay? So magnesium ion would be Mg, it's in group 2A, and so it's going to be plus 2. Now, if I give you a transition na name, then it's going to have the numeral and Roman numerals there. Excuse me, in parentheses, it will have the Roman numeral there. So we have copper 2 ion. Well, that's pretty easy then once we find the symbol for copper. So we get a giveaway telling us where to go look because it's got a transition metal uh, Roman numeral, then we know to go look in the transition metals. So in the middle of the periodic table, we'll look around. Eventually, we'll find copper as Cu, 
And since it's got a Roman numeral 2, that would be the charge, Cu plus 2. All right, how about chromium 6 ion? So again, you'll look in the transition metals because of that Roman numeral. Chromium is Cr, and it's a plus 6. Barium ion. So we'll look for barium. It's not in the middle, but we know it's a metal because it ends in um. And so we find that in group 2A, the symbol is Ba, and it's plus 2. How about mercury 2 ion? So again, we have a Roman numeral. It tells us to look around the transition metals. We find mercury is Hg. The Roman numeral tells us it's a 2, and so it's Hg plus 2. All right, so that's it for our cations. Next, we're going to look at naming anions. And so we're going to finish up naming these pieces, and then we'll break that segment up. So this segment's going to go a little bit longer. So anions, we don't have any sort of random charge there or changing of charges. Their charges are always going to be the same. But what we do do is we denote the negative charge by changing the ending of the name. When we change the name, we change it at the very end. And so what we're going to do is say I'd. Right? We saw this with, remember, sodium chloride. Since it was chlorine at the end, we changed the ending to I-D-E and get sodium chloride. All right, so let's practice that. F minus 1 is fluorine, but since we have a negative 1, we're going to denote that it's an anion by changing the name to fluoride, like fluoride toothpaste. Right? So now you know toothpaste has fluorine in it because it's got fluoride. All right, let's name these. Cl minus 1, kind of just did that. Chloride ion. N minus 3. Right, so now it's no longer nitrogen. We're going to take ogen off, put an IDE in, and we get nitride ion. How about Br minus 1? Bromide. O minus 2. Just like the nitrogen, we're going to take ogen off, and we get oxide. How about Ga plus 3? All right, I hope you did not say galide, but in my courses face-to-face, -face, a lot of people do, right? It's the first bear trap. So I gave you all these negatives, and then boom, there's the positive. So hopefully some of you caught that. It's Ga plus 3. So whenever we have a plus 3, then we look and see what type of metal it is. And it's not a transition metal, so I don't need any Roman numerals. I simply get gallium ion. Don't have to worry about the three at all. All right, now you know I'm going to start doing that to you, so you got to watch out for it. Next thing I want to do is be able to write these as well. So when I get the name, like sulfide ion, I want to be able to come up with the symbol and the charge. So sulfide sounds a lot like sulfur, and so that's what it is. We've taken the UR off, put the IDE on. So we're going to go back to sulfur, which is a capital S. That S is in group 6A, and so it becomes S minus 2. How about iodide ion? Iodide ion, iodine, iodide, becomes iodine, comes from iodine. Iodine is in group 7A, which is a minus 1. And so that gives me I minus 1. How about phosphide ion? Right, so phosphide sounds a lot like phosphorus. Phosphorus, group 5A, negative 3, and so we get P minus 3. All right, strontium ion. Okay, strontium, um, sounds like a metal. So I'm not finding that on the right side of the table. Start looking on the left, and then here it is in group 2A. And so strontium is SR, and it's a plus 2. All right, so that's naming the different ions, writing formulas for the different ions. The next thing we want to do is put those together and make some compounds. And so we'll stop the segment here, take a little break, and we'll come back with naming binary ionic compounds.